Okay, good afternoon, everybody, once again, and thank you very much for your patience. Uh, you know what can happen at these uh, big conferences, and uh, it's just happened delays because of lunch and certain formalities and a large rainstorm as well, uh, which has delayed things. So thanks for your patience. It does mean, though, that we're going to condense two hours of discussion uh, into an hour and a half. That doesn't mean to say it'll be any lighter. It just means I'm going to be a bit more disciplined. And if people go on too long, I'll use my bell. And uh, that'll be my signal that uh, it's time to think of moving on uh, with, with uh, the areas we're covering. Um, this uh, is uh, about infrastructure, public and private roles after the credit crunch. My name is Nick Gowing. I'll be introducing you to the panel shortly. Um, but this is about discovering new insights and uh, new cautions, new optimisms. Um, working out where things are now um, in this vital area of public and private roles after the credit crunch. What I want to do uh, by uh, half past four is try and create at least the feeling that there's greater clarity, however pessimistic it might be, or maybe optimistic, uh, on these critical issues, because so much can rely on PPPs, particularly um, with the current uh, challenges of funding of major infrastructure projects. A couple of things I just want to point out to you. Uh, you will need uh, a translation kit. Um, there, there will be translation of some of the panelists into German on eight, Russian on nine, French on 10, English on 11, uh, and Italian on 12. Um, there'll be no speeches, but we uh, will uh, try and cover three specific areas um, to, f to check and to clarify where uh, the industry thinks um, things are at the moment. Firstly, the impact uh, of the current crisis on existing PPPs and on the PPP market in general. Secondly, what do governments need to do in the short term to mitigate the impact of this crisis on PPPs? And thirdly, what can be done to secure a stable long-term role for private capital and expertise uh, in transport infrastructure. The views from the platform, I hope, are going to be catalysts for you to join in. A smaller room, a bit more informal, could be a bit more conversational, but uh, do feel that you can uh, inject your thoughts as well, and I will be looking around um, to those who might want to uh, disagree violently with anything they're hearing uh, from the platform, or indeed agree. This isn't the beginning of the conference, though. Um, this is already well into it. And so what we don't, don't want to do is go over ground which has been covered already. And so what I'm going to do is ask uh, Lord MacDonald, Gus MacDonald, um, to, who is chairing uh, the session on strategic transport, infrastructure planning and financing, to be the rapporteur, Gus, uh, of what you chaired yesterday so we don't go over that and we use that as a springboard for the discussions over the next hour and 25 minutes. Okay, Nick, um, I hope that uh, gives you a bit of context and helps uh, set the agenda. Uh, two years ago, the OECD was already warning of a growing gap between the global need for more infrastructure investment and the public funds available to build it. The fear now is that this infrastructure gap is destined to get even wider because when public finances are under pressure, infrastructure investment is often the easiest expense to postpone. The OECD's hope is in, expressed in its 2007 report on infrastructure needs to 2030 was that the growing gap would be bridged with the help of the private sector. However, as you know, the financial crisis has driven many banks out of their lending roles and increased the cost of debt. It has also broken the business model of the monoline companies who wrapped and insured uh, high quality infrastructure debt. Now, the banks are retreating into their home territories, or they may be restricting involvement to familiar markets like Western Europe, North America, or Australia. And this will make it more difficult to, find, to fund greenfield projects with higher risk, particularly in developing countries. Now, calculating demand risk is another problem we face uh, with freight traffic down on railways, toll roads and in shipping, and passenger uh, traffic, of course, down in aviation. Now, our workshop heard the UK experts predict that the decline in GDP might reduce traffic volumes to 7% below trend by 2011. So the big question is, is this the traditional blip or is it something more enduring? If so, 
how will we best plan for projects to tackle congestion and bottlenecks in international uh, transport? The private sector investments and transport PPPs may be very exposed to the effects of recession on demand risk. So the question there is, was this risk misallocated by regulators and by public uh, sector authorities in these deals? Now, on the positive side, we welcomed the boost to transport projects and government stimulus packages, but we noted their short-term nature. And we applauded uh, governments like France and Britain who had made extra funds available to guarantee projects already in the PPP pipeline. And the European Investment Bank is clearly playing a, a key role in supplying credit, and we wished it well in its efforts to find a mechanism to compensate for the loss of the monoline insurance function. But we hope that the governmental agencies will map out an exit strategy to avoid competing beyond the current crisis with the private sector funding. Now, we assume that after the stimulus packages have done their work, public funding will be much tighter than before. So how then can the private sector help infrastructure needs? Ideally, of course, by proving that it can provide better public services more efficiently. Now, the most direct route for achieving that in some sectors has been privatization. Will we now see governments selling transport assets to reduce public debt and boost efficiency going forward? Aviation clearly benefited from liberalization, yet the majority of airports globally are still publicly owned. Will more now be sold? And can we also uh, please speed up the rationalization of national air traffic services to reduce costs, improve efficiency, and cut pollution? Now, where can we find more private money in hard times? The most promising pot of investment money, ideally suited to the long-term nature of infrastructure investment, uh, are the trillions of dollars in pension funds and in the insurance industry. Now, the pioneers of infrastructure investment are the Australian, Canadian, and Dutch pension funds, particularly those holding the pensions of public sector workers. So how can governments best encourage pension funds to allocate a greater part of their portfolios to equity investment in essential community services? Our workshop agreed that PPPs are an increasingly efficient mechanism for taking forward transport projects. However, in the more demanding environment ahead, top quality economic appraisal is a priority. Only those schemes that clearly add value should go forward. And lastly, let's try to take the politics out of the PPP process. By a more rigorous analysis, let's eliminate the pet political projects. And we also advise governments to be wary of grand, expensive transport projects. Better, we felt, to define the operational priorities and invest incrementally in smaller scale projects that give us more for less through better balanced, more mature partnerships of the public and private sectors. And if you're looking for uh, these points in more detail, uh, our workshop three conclusions are on the stands out in the foyer. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Gus. Uh, Gus McDonald there. Now, um what I'm going to do is ask um, Enrique diaz Rato in a moment, uh, who's CEO uh, of Sintra Ferrovial, uh, to give us a provocation, if you like, to try and push us even further down this track that has been laid out by that first workshop. Um, but first of all, let me just introduce who else we have up here. Um, first of all, Bert, Cler Bert Clerk, who is chairman of uh, ProRail in Netherlands. You also have various other hats uh, on a more multinational uh, basis as well. Maciej uh, Jankowski, who's from Poland, the Under Secretary of State uh, and Ministry, uh, the Ministry for Infrastructure. Uh, Dominique Brusserot, who uh, is uh, the Minister, uh, Secretary of State for Transport in France, welcome. Roberto Castelli, who is uh, Vice Minister for Infrastructure and Transport uh, in Italy. And uh, you will be, have been listening, Sani Senna, uh, from Turkey, running a number of airports privatized with interest to what the first workshop uh, was saying. And Yves Thibault de Silgi, uh, who joins as CEO of Vinti. W welcome to you all. Now, I didn't introduce um, uh, uh, Enrique with any more detail, but you have prepared a paper uh, for uh, this uh, session. And I'd like you to just push forward some areas that you think 
we should be looking at within those three categories that I laid out at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, it is being argued now that uh, because the primary role of the private sector is to provide uh, alternative funding to infrastructure, and because the financing situation has significantly deteriorated, the consequence is that there is no role or little, if any, for the private sector. I anticipate that I disagree with this argument and I'll elaborate on it. First of all, it is true that the financial situation has significantly deteriorated. Bonds, uh, uh, the bond markets uh, uh, are suffering hard times. Uh, for some ratings, they are almost uh, closed. Monolines have disappeared from the scene at the moment that they would be most needed. And uh, when it comes to bank financing, it doesn't get any better. Uh, the institutions that are ready to participate in a loan have shrinked. The amount uh, they are ready to lend has also shrinked. Uh, the times in which uh, they would underwrite big amounts and later syndicate are over. So the final conclusion and uh, the, the consequence is that margins has gone up. In, in, our business, in our business, it used to be like 100, 120 basis points. They have come up to 300, 350. And usual leverages in, in our business were up to 80%. They are down to 60. So the consequence of all that is that more equity is required in a time in which equity risk premiums are higher. On the other hand side, at the very, in this situation in which more equity is needed, equity is more difficult to obtain. The usual or a traditional way of funding our equity injections in new projects in, in, in developers was to re-leverage uh, our concessions as they matured. Uh, when concessions mature, you put the risks behind you, future cash flows become more predictable and you are able to raise more uh, debt on that asset. So we're sort of in a box, uh, more equity is needed, less equity is available. Those are the bad news. The good news, as uh, had been mentioned before, is that there are new players in this game, particularly sovereign funds, uh, investment funds, and pension funds. They like the, the long term of the concessions. They, f they fit their, their needs. They are quite predictable uh, cash flows, in, at least in the, the highway concession business. They are protected uh, against inflation. And the good news is that uh, uh, they are increasingly participating. And uh, uh, we recently won in Texas uh, two projects in the Dallas area. And not plain vanilla projects, quite complicated projects, greenfield projects with five years of construction. Uh, uh, I'll get later to it. So quite complex projects, and we have been able to team up with uh, both a pension fund and an investment fund. So uh, the good news is that when the economics of the projects are sound, there's uh, capital ready to be injected. Now, going back to the question, I think that the, 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 this argument that the, the primary role of uh, of uh, the private sector is to provide alternative sources of, of financing has two problems. The first one is that it portrays us as a necessary evil. Uh, if public sector had enough funds, we wouldn't be necessary. But most importantly, I think that it is wrong. The, the, the ultimate justification of the participation of the private sector is efficiency. Or simply put, uh, we perform better, sooner, and cheaper than the public sector, not because we are smarter, but because we have the the right incentives. This has not to be confused with the fact that, that we get the sweet deals and the public sector gets the sour ones. If good procurement processes are put around and you make a private sector compete, you can maximize value for the public interest and so to say to extract all the excess sweet uh, from the deal. Uh, some figures may help uh, to illustrate the the scale and, and the possibilities of the private uh, investment in infrastructure. I will just say that in the last two decades, the top 11 world transport infrastructure developers collectively have invested some 280 billion in more than 350 public-private partnership transportation projects. This amount is almost one third of the total amount of the most recent 
United States Economic Stimulus Plan, and several times as much as the amount included in that plan for the National Infrastructure Investment Bank to expand and enhance federal transportation investments. I will spend my last two minutes on what is the, what are some measures that governments could take to optimize the PPP model. And I think that a lot can be done and, and most of these measures fall in one of these three categories. Measures oriented to improve financing, measures oriented to attract equity, and measures oriented to increase feasibility. I'll just outline the, the issues and maybe we can further discuss on them. Regarding the financing, the, there have been some innovative steps taken by uh, some European governments. The, uh, governments are now providing warranties to the loans. They are replacing the role of the monolines, charging a premium, and yet optimizing the, the, the final cost. Other governments are going into direct lending. I, think, uh, I heard the presentation from uh, uh, the, the British government and agency that they are doing direct lending, and they are very happy. One of the problems that we have now is that there, there are very little institutions participating in, 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 in a project. The conditions and the terms of the financing are determined by the worst or the, the marginal lender. So there's room for a win-win situation in which the, 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 the project is optimized in cost and yet the government uh, makes a profit out of it and they were extremely happy. There are other measures like a minimum revenue warranty. There are, there are a bunch of measures that can be done to enhance uh, credit. In the second category, uh, which was uh, measures oriented to attract equity, I don't want to leave out of it the accounting standards. I think that the accounting standards right now penalize uh, the PPP uh, projects. Uh, even if it is a good project, you make losses, accounting losses from the very beginning, and I, I, I don't see the, the sense of that. Second category would be, and, and it was raised before, more efficient uh, risk allocation. Uh, in the recent times, PPP markets were so bullish that developers would be ready to swallow everything. Those times are, are over, and I think that's going to be a good outcome of this crisis. There are some uh, risks that right of way, that it makes no sense uh, for it to be retained by the concessioner. N neither the prices, the, the law that regulates the, the prices, nor the interpretation can be controlled by it. Uh, permits and approvals, supervening events cannot be uh, also uh, transfer to, to the concessioner. We have a re very recent example, Alligator Rally, a big highway in, in Florida. It was tendered and no bids were put. And, uh, okay. And uh, measures, uh, we can go back to that. Measures oriented to increase uh, feasibility uh, under the PPP model, well, if, uh, you need to, to have enough cash flows to reward the investment, so you need to act either to reduce the investment, improve the, the revenues, or reduce the cost. I don't see a reason why term of the concession should be limited to 30 years. Why, if a 50-year concession make it feasible? I don't see the point. What is the point in, in uh, uh, pricing escalation being limited to inflation if, if with a, a higher profile pricing, you can make feasible uh, projects that otherwise uh, are not. There are much to be talked, but uh, uh, there's a lot of room to remove artificial rules that are preventing projects to become feasible under the PPP model. All right, Enrique, thank you for, thank you for that for the moment. Um, I'll underline to you, um, to all of those particularly who've arrived late, that we are under time pressures now because we had to start about half an hour late. But I want to go through these uh, three critical, critical questions we've set right at the beginning. And let me ask all of you, and let's, let's keep it to this one question for the moment. What is the impact of the current crisis on existing PPPs and on the PPP market in general? Sani Senna, uh, you uh, have this challenge uh, with airports particularly. Do you see the market softening or not? 
Yes, I see the market softening because now we are operating seven airports in Turkey and in the region. Now, in, on January, the uh, passenger decline compared to 2007, 2008 was 10%. Now the number, the percentage is coming down. I think by June it will be flat compared to 2007. This is the first issue. The second issue I would like to talk about on the PPPs, I fully agree with Mr. Rato. Now our businesses and PPPs, we have built seven airports, four in Turkey, two in uh, Georgia, Tbilisi and Batumi, and two in Tunisia, Amphita and Monastir, and we are operating them. Only Amphita is going to be finished this year. So we have finished seven PPPs. Indeed, what we have seen is very important. It is a simple equation, simple equation. CapEx, the capital expenditure, has to be equal for the break-even point to revenues minus OPEX minus interest. This is the magic formula to structure up a PPP, either in airports or in other sectors. Now, in this magic formula, the scope of the sites are very important, the public and the private. I mean, the clear definition of the revenues, clear definition of operational expenditures, cost centers, and the, 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 the legislation system, legal infrastructure are very important. Otherwise, if the project is not bankable, you have not any chance to raise even one dollar. Let me give you an example from our, one of our PPP projects. In the uh, tender documents, uh, the uh, client, the public sector, were uh, requiring uh, in, a, in a termination clause, in a termination clause, saying that insufficient uh, operations of the private sector will cause to a termination. With this, with this sentence in, that, in your contract, you have no chance even to raise $1, uh, even if you could bring in libraries of transaction documents. So the clear definition of everything has to be there. So what I'm trying to say is simple. Uh, there is a credit crunch, even it's affecting our existing business. In the formula, the revenues are coming down. Due to the crisis, there is a decline in passenger number. So. Uh, the discipline which you structured in the beginning of the PPP is not there. The revenue is coming down. But we have some solutions for these. In Turkey, now our... Uh, can, can we talk about solutions in a moment? I just want to get okay. an audit of okay. where we are and what your perspective is on this issue. Now, there are two issues. One, you know, in our business, we have organic growth and the inorganic growth. In organic growth, which is in the existing business, there will be some passenger decline in passenger numbers. In inorganic growth, for adding new uh, airports or PPP projects into your portfolio is not difficult, but there will be some difficulty in raising finance. You can raise finance, but the, it will be a little bit costly, and the debt to equity ratio, as Mr. Rato said, will increase. I mean, there will be pre-crisis, we were able to get 20% equity and 80% leverage. Now the leverage came down to 60s, and they are, the financial institutions are asking 40% equity. Right. Can we pause for the moment, because we want to get through, through these three areas. Let me go to Maciej Jankowski from the Ministry for Infrastructure in Poland. Your experience at the moment on existing PPPs and on the market in general. Let's try and keep our remarks as brief as we can, please, again, to get through everything uh, which is challenging us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I must say that the basic core of the Polish road network was constructed in the 70s. So the answer to the question about the infrastructure gap in Poland is self-evident. Despite investment made in the last decade, the remaining share of the work ahead of us is great. So we have set ambitious goals to build or rebuild the backbone of our transport network until 2013. How the current economic situation is affecting, is affecting these ambitious plans? I would say that we can notice three tendencies, two negative and one positive. The first negative tendency is the limiting of the budget resources, but that is evident for everybody. 
But the second negative tendency is the increased difficulty to implement the PPP projects. We have planned that about 480 kilometers of motorways will be built in the PPP scheme until 2012. Unfortunately, the credit crunch is the most affecting for the PPP projects. Recently, we have abandoned negotiation on the under 100 kilometers long section of A2 motorway in the pan-European corridor berlin warsaw moscow because the potential investor requested that the major burden of risk to be shifted towards the state budget. So we had to take this in, uh, financing of this investment on the state uh, side. But naturally, there is also the positive tendency resulting from the economic downturn. These are the falling prices in the construction contracts because the global recession on the construction market had, has caused the increased competition. Currently, we are free uh, PPP projects on motorway with the contracts already signed, but awaiting the financial closure. And to ease the burden of negotiations with the commercial banks, we have turned to the European Investment Bank because our private partners uh, have enormous problems with uh, financing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, there are many contrasts here. Let's hear one of those contrasts, the contrast with France now. Minister Bousserot, um, your experience, you have a very significant commitment to PPPs in the coming years, and you've just reminded us over lunch, not least, on the railway system. How are you being impacted? Are you feeling any impact in France? The experience we've had so far have been a sort of concession experiences and that applies to a major part of our motorway uh, network, the tunnels that we built here, connecting us with Spain and other areas as well. I'd like to give you one example. It's the most complicated, most difficult project. So there was a 300 kilometer long uh, high speed rail connection that we were supposed to, to build here towards the south, towards the Spanish border, starting from Tours, going all the way to Toulouse. And so an existing rail connection here, for a high speed rail connection. And here we wanted to have a PPP, public private partnership, for financing for these three kilometers. Eight billion euros was the price. And uh, first of all, the, we said the private uh, partners will take up four million, and the remaining four million were to be divided by the national government, two million and the region government, two million, and, uh, and two billion. And uh, they said it was difficult here for the, for the districts, for the regional governments to, to get together these two billion. And uh, the Caisse de Depot, this Fr French Finance Institute, we were to guarantee a bond here for over 15 years. And in doing so, then the part which had to be taken on by the regional governments then that part could have been financed. But then the four billion remained for the private sector. There were three groups. So we're still inviting tenders. In a few weeks, we will enter into the second phase. What can we say about these three companies? They have difficulties difficulties to get the funding together, to get money from banks. And the measures that have been taken by our government here in order to help the economy say that whenever there are problems like this, the government will help out. So on the one hand, I'm quite optimistic. My friend and, and colleague uh, already said that this morning here, Mr. Antonielli, that we need to uh, re achieve a recovery. We have to do it long term, not just uh, short term, but over 10 years or so. So on the one hand, I'm optimistic. On the other hand, I see the difficulties in implementation. It's not easy. Well, with regard to Bordeaux, we are here we've already shown that these high-speed rail connections are quite promising and successful. And with regard to the air link here between Paris and Toulouse, and we've achieved a major improvement. 
So, we have 80% of the passengers here have moved here from planes to trains uh, between Paris and Toulouse. That's a major success. And if we look at other markets in the high speed rail network, then we see major successes. It's not easy, but uh, it's, it's good. I can tell you more about it in a few weeks to come. Do you believe that your very robust model in France at the moment is under threat in any way? on PPP. Yes, for the very first time, we have major projects like this. Up to now, we've always worked with this classic concession model here for motorways. For instance, we've been working for 30 years now and uh, for the motorways here. And now we have 2,000 kilometers of high-speed rail connections. Yeah? About 75% are covered here, and we have to achieve it by 2020. And then we're building a canal here between Paris and Belgium, another 4 billion euros. And in addition to that, a new automatically guided metros, 35 million euros. And that is just for the planning phase, and maybe more. Huh? Other funding possibilities especially when it comes here to uh, purchasing the land needed here. The, but for Paris, we need to see we've signed certain contracts with the companies, and now we have to see how it's going to work out. And this link I mentioned here between Tours and Bordeaux, here we will try out this new system and we'll see how it works. As I said, there's a, uh, for 140 kilometers, uh, we there's sort of a trial uh, link, only three billion, and uh, that will be the first test. Um, from the Vinci perspective, and after all, you're involved with building, financing. Uh, operating transport infrastructure, um, public facilities, and particularly motorways and car park uh, concessions. Do you share the, the view of the Secretary for Transport in France? Oui. De toute façon, je ne veux pas dire que je ne partage pas ses vues, parce que je ne sais pas ce qui m'arriverait en rentrant à Paris. Donc, je ne peux que partager les vues de mon ministre. Yes, I, I, I can only agree with what my minister says, but uh, I would like to say something about the method. Uh, just just uh, one remark on the method and the terminology. And what's the difference here between the cost concession model and this? I mean, this is something that we use in France and in other countries in, in southern Europe. And now it, it's spreading to other countries as well. So this concession model and the PPP model. So this, is what, especially for in the concession model, is what relates to, to transport here. That is in the con what the concessee takes on. Well, you need to build a bridge, for instance. Here we have major amounts of money in this investment involved, and it's no question uh, that uh, this is closely linked to the, to the traffic which will travel across the bridge. So we have to make a difference infrastructure and and the traffic. It's, and this is a model that can develop further because at the moment what we see in the European countries, here we have reached a level of debt which surpasses everything we've ever seen before. And so there's a criterion here from, from the Treaty of Maastricht, 60% debt uh, uh, compared with uh, gross domestic product. If you look at the uh, debt ratio at the moment compared to the GDP, then we are in a situation which is really dangerous, so a situation which has nothing to do with healthy financing or healthy budgets. Of course, we have different stimulus packages, so we will go up to 80 percent debt, and in the next few years, uh, we will no longer be able to finance certain projects by increasing debt. That's just not possible, huh? just not possible. 
Can you find it from tax revenues? Um, that's a sensitive question, but of course we need all these projects. Uh, and if you look at how Europe is developing uh, this whole waterways, the road connections, the rail connection bridges, also in Eastern Europe, and we need to now ask ourselves, how can we finance it? Maybe new financing models here by users paying. So here we have to select uh, projects and we have to make a choice, uh, the good and bad projects good projects where you have a real benefit and benefit for many users and if you have users who really need this they must be willing to pay for it and not just here asking for the government to to fund it so financing funding what is the main problem if i look at my company here and um, within a time frame of less than a year that is since July of 2008 uh, despite the financial crisis we have managed to realize projects uh, amount to 5 billion euros be it PPP or these franchise or concession projects I mean and that that's quite a major amount uh, if you look at uh, here the uh, stimulus packages and the projects in there I think we are already far ahead so at the moment we were already dealing with mature projects in order to fund projects nowadays you need uh, something that goes beyond uh, 30 years the monolines are no longer there uh, that means we have not no longer the old guarantee systems and that's a problem we need to solve it means can the government uh, provide such a guarantee and that's what we're trying and we, of course we try to to get back uh, the money that we've taken out of the debt and to refinance it. How could you disagree with your minister? But of course, he works for the government and you work for a, a large corporation. So there's an important uh, difference there, um, in, which is why I'm asking you both the question. Let's move on to the railway systems. Um, what's your view on PPP, given that PPP is still very much um, in its infancy when it comes to railway systems? And we were talking over lunch um, about the fact that it's quite difficult to work out how PPP can work uh, in a rail system, Bert Klerk. Because not only are you representing ProRail in the Netherlands, you do have a number of other hats which you wear across railway systems. Yes, Nick. Um, answering your question short is rather difficult uh, because when you look over Europe, you see in different countries different models, as, as the French minister already explained. Um, when I look at the Netherlands, um, I might say that um, PPP is difficult. Uh, let me s start saying that I'm in favor of, of, of private funding. Although I'm the CEO of a state-owned uh, company, I like funding as much as possible, and I'm indifferent where it comes from, as long as I have the funding. Um, but PPP is difficult from several reasons. The credit crunch now is one reason, but underlying is in some countries, as for example my country, uh, people think that rail is, well, rail has always been considered as a state business and should stay state business. And every involvement of private partners is considered with a fair amount of, of suspicion. That's two. Second, uh, uh, thirdly, when you look at the market moment in, in this, at this moment, there is a downfall of demand. So calculating uh, your demand, freight, uh, uh, um, um, f rail freight has fallen down in the first quarter of 2009 with 25, 20 to 25%. Um, uh, passenger uh, uh, by rail has, well, not really decreased, but the growth, which was in the Netherlands about and around 5% per year in the, in the, in the, in the last couple of seven years, has stabilized uh, 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 for this moment. So there is a calculating of risks also on the demand, demand side. And then when you go, when you enter in PPP, as far as rail infrastructure is concerned, you enter in a long time uh, um, uh, um, um, cooperation with public and private partners. When I look on one of the successful, more or less successful uh, uh, public-private partnerships in the Netherlands, that's the high-speed line between Amsterdam and Paris, as far as the Netherlands and the Belgium are part is concerned. 
the contract is so complex that I need about, let's say, a full-time staff of lawyers who are dealing with the contract. So my, one of my demands for public-private partnership would be that the contract should be drafted, it should be possible to draft it on, for example, one uh, a sheet of paper. When I have two booklets to uh, uh, fill with the contract, I should be suspicious of, of what is uh, written down there. So is it in, in danger, uh, uh, public-private par par partnership at this moment? The answer is yes. Right. Um, Roberto Castelli, uh, Vice Minister for Infrastructure and Transport, your view on where PPPs stand currently, particularly in your country? The Italian government in March of this year adopted a stimulus package amounting to 17 billion euros. And 8 billion out of the 17 are provided by private funding. So we see that the private sector is very important for PPPs. What are the problems involved? As far as we are concerned, we don't see a major impact of the global credit crunch. Of course, uh, there was an increase in interest rates fine, but that has nothing to do with the lack of funding. And I also like to remind you the fact that Italy has a very high budget deficit and also very high uh, private savings. The Italian bank uh, holds more than 25 million accounts, savings accounts, or private savings accounts, and they hold around one at ten billion euros eh, in liquid funding, so there's no lack of that. The problem that we have is a different one. It is related to our infrastructure. We have road infrastructure projects, and uh, they allow us to invest there 20 for 20, 30 years, oh, well, that kind of period, oh, so a secure investment. And with this kind of infrastructure, we don't have any major problems at the moment, so we don't have lack of funding there. Uh, in about a month, we will start construction work on the link between Milano, Milan towards the south, uh, 15 uh, billion euros here of private funding. So we have very long-term projects for motorways. These were always very interesting projects for us here. Seventy percent of uh, these type of infrastructure measures. Uh, we, we call it the, the warm infrastructure. That uh, means uh, you have sure repayment for the investors. So we have lots of franchise or concessions here. The problem is there are many uh, things here from north of the Alps here, yeah, Zurich in Switzerland and or France, and we calculated that uh, due to the economic development, we need to understand when, if be it 2020 or 25, uh, motorway crossing the Alps will be saturated, that will no ha have no more trucks going through there. It, it's sure that it will happen. We don't know when, but we are sure it will come to that. So what can we do to prevent this from happening? And it's very important for Italy because we are among the number one exporters worldwide. We need to export our goods towards the north where our trading partners are located. We need to rail tunnels, and they are very expensive. And we haven't found a formula for that yet in order to use PPPs for that. But that is really vital for us because we know that we absolutely need to increase the share of this means of transport in all the 
conference, as we also heard it last year, that always the same question being posed. A passenger who travels by train uh, cause 70 percent less pollution than a passenger traveling by car. So we need to find a system which allows us to include private industry also for major infrastructure projects. So how can we sort of provide an incentive to pr uh, private industry for this? That's the major question we need to ask. I'd like to throw it open. Um, those of you who've arrived late, we're also going to try in the next um, uh, 45 minutes to talk about how governments can mitigate the impact, particularly in the current financial crisis, and also how to create a stable long-term role for private capital. Gus McDonald, can I come to you as a former uh, Minister of Transport, now uh, in a significant investment bank, uh, mainly because, uh, of course, when you were a minister, you were involved in setting up uh, quite a lot of PPP deals in the British transport system. That was almost 10 years ago. But when you listen to the dilemmas here and, and the, the way things are being viewed differently in different countries, what's your reflection now you're seeing it from the banking and investment sector? My first reflection is that um, the PPP process is very much more mature than it was when I came into government in 1999. Um, for instance, we had a, a great deal of political trouble in just introducing the concept of PPP, although in some ways I suppose we had seen it as a, a social democratic uh, compromise following the unpopularity of privatization in the United Kingdom as successful though the privatization often turned out to be. Uh, but on the other hand, very difficult to fight through the National Air Traffic Service's part privatization. I'm delighted to say that it's worked out well, it's more efficient, it's more profitable, and by all accounts, it's uh, also a safer system. So that was worth the political uh, capital that we invested in it. The London Tube, in which I spent two years of its uh, six-year uh, progression, um, that was much more problematic and remains so. And uh, in terms of complexity, I don't think there's anything yet to equal it. I think the transaction charges, I think when I last looked at them, were around 500 million uh, pounds. So the good thing about that, though, was that it did commit the British Treasury uh, to an investment that the Tube had never had before over a period of 30 years and then investing in a very consistent fashion. So the Tube does now run much better, but politically, again, very, very damaging. The Channel Tunnel Rail Link, I think we gave very sweet terms to the uh, private sector involved in that, but it did come in, it did come in uh, on time and uh, on, on budget, I'm, I'm pleased to say. In Britain now, there's been a great deal of experience. There's over 640 uh, projects have been closed in the UK, totaling around 64 billion. Uh, recently, our Treasury, at very short notice, set up uh, an infrastructure finance unit which will carry through the 13 billion that's in the PFI, the, the Public Finance Initiative pipeline. So that's very welcome. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, from a market perspective, I was very pleased that our M25 motorway uh, has actually now found its finance from the banks. It's taken them many months to get there, but they've succeeded. From a Macquarie perspective, we work as, um, as advisors as well as, uh, as principals in a lot of deals. And uh, it's interesting that the money still can be found. It's just very hard work. But we've raised substantial sums in, uh, in America. Uh, we've put together money uh, in, in France and in Ireland. So it can be found. It's not uh, all doom and gloom, but it is very hard work. Because you use that word maturity. Is it maturity with stability? or maturity with still massive and significant problems? There, are, there are, still are uh, some problems to be ironed out, but we have learned a lot of lessons, partly because we've made an awful lot of mistakes. But to the credit of the British Treasury, they've published regular reports on uh, what those mistakes have been and what the lessons uh, are that have been learned. Uh, so again, from our workshop yesterday, there are clearly areas in which we could do more in the, one of the problems with the London Tube, for instance, is that we had a consortium in there of very considerable companies, but not underpinned by parent company guarantees. So that, um, you know, 
when the, um, that consortium had to pull out when it went into uh, administration, its losses were relatively uh, slight in comparison with uh, the kind of money that was involved there. So that w but that was um, obviously a deal done many years back. Thank you. Anyone want to come in, particularly with your own experiences on PPP, uh, the issue of uh, the impact of the current crisis, this audit? I know it's taking a bit of a long time, but we want to be clear where there are the positive sides, but also the negative sides, please. Thank Could you all identify yourself as well? Tony, Tony Barclay from the European Rail Freight Association, which is a private sector groupings of uh, rail freight. My, my theme is actually raising how, how the railways could raise money for some of these issues. Um, and it's could, wonderful. Tony, to could you just address, though, the impact of the current crisis on existing PPPs well, the, and the market in general? Well, the market in general, we've got three ministers here, all of whom's national incumbent train operators are in financial trouble. My suggestion is that rather than give them state aid, which is going to make the situation worse, they should sell them to the private sector and use the money to support infrastructure investment in the railways. And it'd be very interesting to hear the reaction from um, Poland, Italy and France to that idea. And overall, the impact on PPP deals from your it's, perspective? It's getting, a, it's getting a very great deal worse. And I, you know, don't know where it's going to go. Ministers, do you want to announce here whether you're going to take it, whether you're going to float off or... Minister Boussereau, first of all. Very, let's make this very quick and then move on. Uh, could you use another microphone? Je suis, je suis persuadé que... Well, I'm convinced that was this reheating here and there will be an endurance development of the railways. It is the mode of transport for the century is to come in Libya, China, Africa, especially everywhere railways are being constructed because they have a high profitability prospect. And um, it is the local authorities or the customers, and it depends on who pays, which community, the client or the local authorities um, or uh, the public sector. Well, uh, there we have, uh, for example, sidings going to the port of Hamburg or to Bremen, which are highly profitable, or we have the high-speed trains here, uh, which are superimposed on the classical type of railway routes. You can gain a lot of money in the 20th century if well managed, whatever the mode of management is, are highly profitable. New highly specialist investment is a profitable one. That's true that uh, our state budget is, is very tight. So um, uh, we have, uh, we had to shift the priority of some uh, railway projects to the reserve category. Uh, as far as the road projects are concerned, uh, we are planning to increase the share of the National Road Fund, the public but non-budgetary financial institution. So this fund will take the loans from the international financial institution or will issue bonds guaranteed by the state budget. So we are try to, trying to find uh, non-budgetary uh, financing. All right. Uh, Minister Castelli, quickly. Well, I do agree with what the previous uh, people said, Dominic Zero, but now at the present point in time, railway transport is not successful to uh, make a rate making uh, which makes the operation profitable. And uh, so very often a customer prefer road haulage, and this is our dilemma. And so we must have a financing system for transport, uh, railway transport, to make uh, that uh, profitable and uh, competitive. This is not the case for the time being. This particular question, emblematic 
of the problems of shifting something into the private sector or having a public-private partnership? Microphone, please. I think that, uh, I think that the, the importance of the, the risk allocation cannot be stressed enough and, and cannot be overstated. My colleague mentioned that a single sentence make a project bankable or unbankable. I'll give you an, a, a short example. Duration of the, of the contracts. It has been very much criticized long-term concession contracts. But the point is that long-term, uh, essential feature of long-term concession contracts is that they are much more resi resilient to crisis. The point is this, we have one concession that we run together with Macquarie, that in the worst circumstances, which has been the last year, we have been able to refinance almost $1 billion. What is the, the, the ultimate reason for that? That the economics of the, uh, of the concession are very sound. So uh, there is a need to develop and implement sound concession models. Nobody, because we haven't had a crisis, strong crisis in the last 20 years, these situations were difficult to anticipate. But the crisis we are suffering is really unprecedented and the, the, the world is becoming wasted. But we are seeing roads in Europe in which the decline in heavy vehicles is 30, 40%. There's no, there's not in the last 50 years of, of history such decreases, but these things happen. And the ability to resist downturns of two concessions, one of 20 years and one of 80, is extremely different. So term of, uh, the duration of the concession, very highly criticized in the past, the long term, has become crucial. And uh, Any other contributions on impact on, on, on PPPs at the moment? Anyone got personal experience uh, either in a ministry or in a big corporation? Um, anyone, particularly from the developing world, who'd like to contribute, please? Can we get a microphone here? Right at the front. Ministry of Transport from the Republic of Macedonia. We already signed up agreement with TAF. He is the representative and CEO of TAF. Uh, a few days ago, the many international companies that TAF already applies for the credit came to Macedonia and they've sent us a big questionnaire and they ask many questions in order to be sure then the, in the following years the investment of the TAF will be payable for them. So TAF already has the problem to find the financial, to close the financial package in order to start to build the uh, Macedonian airports. We, we postponed the investment for six months only for the financial crisis. So the financial crisis has a big impact on the uh, PPP or the concession process. Uh, those days we will uh, we'll close all the necessary documents together with the Louis Berger, the French consulting company. And in June, Macedonian government will start the official procedure for uh, PPP for the roads in Macedonia. Whole package, it's uh, 550 kilometers. It is investment of 1.8 billion of euros. So in June, we will start with that procedure, but we spoke with many uh, financial institution companies, with many uh, infrastructure, infrastructural companies they are, that are aware that they will find uh, financial sources in order to, to, uh, to bid on the tender. The main problem is to find the uh, financial sources in order to build either the roads or airports or, uh, I don't know, railways. The main problem is not the, the, the process, but the main problem is the how to find the fresh financial sources in order to finance the projects. So in June we will start, but we are not so optimistic that we'll, uh, that we'll find uh, some concessioner that will bid on the tender and we will start to bid the tenders. Even though before, only before uh, eight months ago, we have 42 entities that were interesting to come to Macedonia and to play the role in the concession of the roads. This is how the financial crisis have an impact on the concession uh, or PPP in general. Any others quickly? Any other, any other hands? I can't see if, if it's a bit dark over there. No, I can't see any at the moment. Let, well, let's move on. Um, 
Uh, Lord Macdonald talked about a new maturity, particularly from the British perspective, of 640 projects. But could we move in these last two categories, the second two uh, and third categories, to try and explore what the um, a sound model is in this kind of uh, environment, particularly with the economic downturn, um, particularly efforts to mitigate the impact of this crisis on these uh, PPP deals? Can I go to uh, Minister Brussero for the moment? What do you believe? You have talked very robustly about the French experience. What is the lesson, therefore, for um, other countries where, as we've just heard, PPPs are struggling? What is the sound model that you believe could emerge from this which others could adapt? It's a bit too early to say what a sound model would be. Well, in the light of the economic crisis we are facing right now, well, uh, at the uh, even at the end of the 2009, well, uh, we must see that they are uh, resilient. We have to see what the clients are, uh, it's easier to build a high-speed line between major metropolitan areas rather than uh, do something in the city of Paris. Like our Italian friend said, it's easier to make a route between Torino and uh, uh, another big town. Well, we have a large tunnel between Italy and France, which is in construction to stay on the French side, uh, it is easier to find financial means to go uh, uh, from Marseille to Italy here. And uh, there will be right away traffic incurred in the airports here uh, or, and the competition between airports and uh, road traffic. So it's easier to have this kind of mode of traffic that rather than uh, building a uh, uh, canal system here between the southwest of uh, France to Belgium here. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's perhaps banal to say it's easier uh, to have this kind of large distance projects rather than the localized ones. And But I'm still quite optimistic. And uh, but even outspoken here, that uh, in the light of the, lots of projects which should be implemented, matters are very difficult. Minister, what could be done? Is there some advice from the French point of view of how other governments who are struggling could mitigate the impact of this current crisis? Je crois que la I think the solution would be that the state should come in and help the banking sector. And the banking sector, per se, uh, should uh, sort of have a bridging function to the large companies. For these major PPP uh, projects, uh, public works, uh, international public works companies, uh, if they can't get a financing, then the state should come in and help them with financial means. About that, because that came up in your session yesterday, didn't it? But I know you're not a British government minister anymore, but the British government essentially becoming something of a banker during the current uh, PPP challenges. Is, is that something which you now on the financial and investment side think is helpful in this current short-term crisis? Well, certainly in uh, the, um, the TIFU, the, the Treasury Infrastructure Finance Unit, that's uh, certainly been very important that the government's come in there and kept the, pi the pipeline of PPP and uh, PFI flowing. Uh, in an ideal world, uh, I can see the great advantage, as the French minister has said, of the support from the bank being uh, repaid, in, in a sense, by offering um, some kind of insured uh, terms to 
infrastructure investment. And it could be that you could define that, uh, particularly where you had regulated infrastructure uh, assets, that uh, you would therefore have more oversight of it. However, there's a very long queue, obviously, of, of industries and sectors looking for uh, preferential treatment at the moment. So I, I don't see any immediate signs of that. It would be good, too, if uh, the governments would think about how they might best uh, replicate the monoline function, uh, perhaps in the short to medium term, if that were a state activity, if they could set up an institution quickly to do, to do that, uh, they could then privatize it later, because I think the monoline function will come back, but um, not for some time yet. And I know that the EIB is working on its models and trying to, to uh, come up with something positive. So that, um, as I say, at the moment, the, the governments can do uh, so much, but uh, in the end, it'll be tough times for governments. We, you're going through uh, the boost from the stimulus packages at the moment. Uh, that will run out in a few years' time, and then that's when the real crunch will come in, and we already see in the UK budget uh, talk of cutting uh, public investment uh, literally in half over the, the next few years. Let me encourage as many views as possible from the panel, then we can move on to the third category as well, Yves Thibault de Silgui. Oui, moi je, je pense que... I think uh, a lot of things could be done for uh, some very simple reasons here. As it has been said by a previous speaker, we have to uh, get uh, mobilized now. We have lost the monolines now. And what can we do? We have the pension funds. This is a legal, uh, a financial instrument which we can use. And the European approach, which is not so widely uh, used up to now, we have the five uh, billion of the financial uh, budgeting, 25% uh, for uh, yeah, and I think we could uh, uh, really, really uh, use the European uh, bank here uh, to play a more. Uh, active role. We have the structural funds which are geared to the different regions and and the regional development uh, element has been disregarded up to now. The Commission is too much afraid of uh, having a lot of red tape and bureaucracy when getting the private sector involved. And uh, we have to coordinate the uh, financial actors uh, of all kinds and categories to get them interested in major projects. Europe could do more in this field. And I think um, since uh, we don't have these monoline business orientations anymore, we could have state guarantees, uh, some kind of national funds or uh, multinational or European ones uh, to issue some of uh, the bonds or uh, debentures here. And um, this is perhaps Again, one I'm of the means. On ideas for mitigating. And just keep the microphone. Are you suggesting the pension funds could act in the short term to mitigate the crisis? No, I think the pension funds are instruments to sort of collect funds on a long-term basis. And uh, so they should be geared to infrastructural problems because they have a permanent kind of uh, revenue uh, prospect. And to sort of gear these financial means into infrastructural uh, projects because you have a high degree of security here, even uh, if uh, perhaps the earnings are are lower than in some highly speculative funds. But this is a lesson to be learned of our uh, crisis here. The pension funds um, have a, a better permanence here. Uh, this was also perhaps the example of Asia. Now, uh, the money in the world is not evaporated. The money is there. Infrastructure funds are sitting on $70 billion. But the conditions are hard. I mean, when for Macedonia, when we go to EBRD and EIB, they are saying po they are positive, but they are putting on some conditions. That's why they are asking thousands of questions. 
to, to understand the old clarity of the project. As I say, the, the structuring of the PPPs are very important. In Turkey, we finished seven, seven, our Ministry of Transport completed seven PPP projects in airports. Why? Because the structuring was there. I mean, the clear definition of all the revenue centers, all the uh, OPEX centers were there. So uh, I believe in credit crunch, but again, I am insisting that if the structure of, the, of a PPP is sound and is clearly defined, there is no difficulty in raising finance in our business. Between 2000 and 2005, we have operated Atatürk Airport, Istanbul Atatürk Airport, on BOT basis. And in 1999, there was a devastating uh, earthquake. The impact of that earthquake was in our first operation year, 2000, and then we experienced 9-11, Afghanistan war, Iraq war, SARS disease, avian flu, everything was there. All kind of external shocks was there. Again, we have received 11.2% uh, compound average growth rate in passenger number. So this means that airport businesses uh, are sound businesses and crisis-free businesses, I may say. Now we are experiencing Crisis-free businesses. businesses. Now we are experiencing some decline in passenger number, but it is very easy to um, control your cost and manage your cash flow management. So uh, let me give you an example. In 2009, uh, for the four months result, our revenue declined by 7%, but we were able to decline our cost as well. So the EBITDA is equal to the last year. So I am, in a way, pessimistic uh, in the sector. Now, but what, what I would like to say is, uh, crisis is an issue which starts and finishes. But this does not mean that when the crisis finishes, everything will be the same like pre-crisis. Post-crisis, everything will be changed. Einstein has a saying. He says that you cannot solve the problems in the systems thinking, thinking where they were created. So we have to move to a different dimension. And we will move. What can we do to mitigate? What can we do? I mean, there may be some innovative hybrid solutions, like we have done in Turkey. Our Ministry of Transport is here. We have done in Turkey. They give passenger guarantees. In emerging market, in order to promote PPPs, they give passenger guarantees. If the passenger is there, then they made lease agreement, profit share, BOTs, BOs. So there are a lot of schemes in PPPs that we may use. These, these innovative hybrid solutions will be there and uh, because there is a huge capacity crunch at the same time. There's a credit crunch, but capacity crunch. I will give a number and I'll finish. By 2020, 2.5 million flights will be unaccommodated in Europe. Because aircraft, due to the liberalization of the uh, aviation sector, especially in, sec in Turkey, really we achieved huge number of increases in passenger numbers. One billion people in the coming decade will be urbanized. They will come from the rural areas to the cities. So they will start to use the global products, global trade, and global trans transport. So we have to be ready, mainly through PPPs. All the infrastructures has to be ready. And which country is first, they will capture the existing market portion. But and then Enrique, this, this the business, particularly picking up on innovative hybrid solutions. Do you see those emerging to mitigate the impact at the moment? Um, no, not yet. Um, um, answering to your question, I see three possible solutions. Well, one is a more long term. Um, um, Lord Macdonald said the the PPP projects in in the UK, well, they are more mature. I think there's still a need of sharing best practices. And I would like to point out that, for example, on the European level, recently uh, um, the European PPP expertise center was, was launched. I think that is still necessary to share best practices. That's one. Secondly, 
I think that, um, and I agree with the former speaker, that the pension funds could step in because they find, in my opinion, um, I think they find infrastructure investments more secure and safer than uh, the investments they have done in, for example, uh, 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 financial products. So I think the, the, there, is, there is a real possibility for the pension funds to step in. Se thirdly, I think um, it's all about uh, the calculation of the risks. So I think uh, uh, perhaps on the short term, we should have a discussion on the division of the risk between the public and the private partners. You could agree on a, let's say, in time moving uh, uh, sharing of the risks which might make it attractive on the short run for the private partners to stay in. For example, in the Netherlands, we have a private-public partnership on the development of uh, uh, railways, motorways, and uh, um, the development of uh, um, um, houses, etc., where the banks have opted out because they can't, they, they're not sure about the risks on the infrastructural side. Perhaps this is a good moment for the pension funds then to step in with a different sharing of the risks. For the short, short run, that, that might be a solution. Is there anyone from a pension fund here who'd like to tell us this is a great idea or is going to offer money today? Uh, or anyone from that community, the broader community, the financial services community, pension, long-term investment? I can't see anyone. I also want to ask, is there anyone from the EIB or the World Bank I can't see anyone immediately. Ah, uh, would you like to come in on, on mitigating, uh, on what you can do to mitigate at least this short-term challenge in order to maintain the mo momentum of PPPs? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I might reiterate a few things that um, Just said, remind us who you are. Were said uh, yesterday, my name is Matthew Arndt. I lead the uh, rail and road division, so we have quite a large volume of um, PPP activity, particularly in the road sector, but actually right now, interestingly, quite a few rail projects as well. Um, I mean, the, the first basic comment is quality of the projects, economic fundamentals matter tremendously, and that's what creates confidence in the financing community at the EIB and in the IFIs in general. Um, very short term, what's happening at the IB is, thanks to an increase in capital, very significant amounts in our ability to lend on our basic products, senior loans, uh, hopefully guaranteed. Difficult, actually, to get guarantees today, so we have to think, and we are thinking, about how we can also be providers of guarantees. We already have one window for that, which is the loan guarantee on TENS transport, which is supposed to guarantee a certain piece of traffic risk, which is particularly difficult, which is ramp up. Um, but we're thinking about other possibilities um, to guarantee other types of risks. And then, of course, as uh, Lord MacDonald uh, said earlier, um, in fact, a more a broader form of guarantee, which would be to step in temporarily, probably, in lieu of the monolines to sort of um, kickstart a rebirth of some kind of monoline um, industry. And on the equity side, the IB is already involved in infrastructure funds, but there, there is a mandate which uh, Commissioner Tajani uh, mentioned in his speech this morning to um, look at the so-called 2020 or Marguerite Fund, do not ask me why it's called Marguerite, um, uh, which would be for the EIB to take direct equity participations um, in projects. Uh, there is, of course, an issue of how long it takes to set up all of these things <laughs> and what will the situation be once uh, the product actually... I was going to uh, say, we're talking about short-term mitigation, which short means acting nimbly. Short acting nimbly means increases in volumes. To be, to be perfectly blunt, that's, that's what's happening. And um, I think the example of Poland is actually quite uh, revealing in that sense because we were able to step in with a uh, loan amount that was quite significant on one of the uh, PPP deals, which is way beyond what we would normally have been doing um, even just a year ago. But uh, while you've got the microphone there, Matthew, um, the issue of stabilizing private funding uh, arrangements. Do you see this now as a critical challenge 
given the current crisis and the speed at which it's hit? Well, certainly for, for us it is a critical challenge because we're involved in, in all of these deals. Now, in a, in a more systemic way, I think that everybody has a role to play, particularly the, uh, the, the public authorities who are designing, selecting projects. Um, the, the people who are actually carrying out the procurement process, because, I mean, what we are seeing now, and this is very... Um, this is this is this is very visible right now is that the the procurement processes are delayed um, there are very difficult negotiations bidders are not able to bring to the table committed finance the banks uh, make uh, all sorts of conditions to their to their commitment and so there's a whole negotiation phase which didn't necessarily exist six months ago. Um, and here, uh, there is a need for flexibility and uh, intelligent negotiation, which is a bit more straining, let's say, than it used to be. Thank you very much indeed. We've got about 10 minutes, and I think we're trying to close the circle here. Enrique, you wanted a word. Well, I, I wanted to give my... So, uh, I'm pessimistic about the prospects of PPP in emerging markets, and probably not for the same reasons that have been pointed out. I think there are two features in our business that make it distinct. It is capital intensive and long term. So you begin this game by sinking a lot of money and with the expectation to recover it in many years. So the room for opportunistic behavior is very big. And the ability of any grantor to inflict pain on the concessioner enormous. So it, is, it becomes a precondition to enter into an emerging market that the rules of the game are clear and enforceable. There's nothing you can do in the short term to increase the reliability of the judicial system. The surprising part is that you can, you can hire uh, consultants to advise you about the, the right rules of the game. And in that respect, I, I have to say, it, I don't want to mention countries, <laughs> that the advice has been very poor, very poor. And for sure, it's not gonna work in the current situation in which uh, players are m much more sensitive to risk. But that, that's my honest view. Maciej Jankowski, you just heard Matthew Arndt refer to Poland in particular. Give us an insight into how important that kind of relationship is, given the fragility of some of your contract, some of your PPP arrangements at the moment, which you've already identified. How important has that commitment been to sustaining some of them? I'm a, uh, I must go for the yellow one. Yes, this time is okay. I must say that the main conclusion drawn from our experience is that uh, the main advantage of PPP scheme, so the risk management, has been greatly diminished. So uh, public authorities like our government, uh, which are interested in carrying uh, PPP projects today, have to accept shift in the risk sharing in their disfavor, as you mentioned, uh, more or less the same. Or help to find for contractors alternative sources of financing other than commercial banks. For example, like European investment banks. So we try to do it because we are still committed uh, in these uh, schemes, but uh, we must say that there are a lot of problems that, uh, that show all this uh, model of financing uh, new investments, uh, that show that this model of financing new investment uh, maybe is not the best one. So maybe we should finance more from directly from the budget. And Bert, you mentioned the EIB as well, didn't you? About the importance of, of those uh, public funding bodies. Yes, um, but there is one issue the representative of the EIB mentioned, which I would like to stress. All partners have to play their role. Um, and when I, when I look at the sector I represent, the infrastructure management uh, sector and the railway undertaking, I think we should be more proactive to deliver a better performance, which makes us as a sector more attractive for private financing. That's also, you know, that's, it's all on 
risk division. One of the reasons private <coughs> partners don't step in, because they are, as far as the rail sector is concerned, they are still not satisfied, and they are right, with the performance of, of the railway business. As when we are capable of the delivering a better product for our customers, it's easier for the, for the, for the private business and, and, and the bankings to step in because they have a better idea about their risks. Now they don't have that, that idea. We've really morphed into the last category in the last few minutes, talking about the long-term long stability which can be generated for private capital. And um, Gus MacDonald raised right at the beginning, based on the workshop yesterday, not just pension funds, but also sovereign wealth funds. Can I ask any of you to contribute in these last few minutes uh, about the value of some of these other contributions which have been raised, whether they could help uh, provide that stability. Minister. Ten years ago, a PPP project in the eyes of many in France and other parts was just the panacea. But today, we are saying, well, the French proverb that you, well, that, that you shouldn't uh, throw the baby out with the bathtub here and uh, with the bathwater. And uh, what should we say? Um, a PPP is a project which might not work. So maybe I'm too optimistic when I say that we will overcome the present crisis and uh, Transport uh, will mark the end of the crisis globally and will lead to an upswing again. So transport will be even more important than the past. Huh? Maritime transport will play an important role. Today we have around 100 vessels which can transfer up to 14,000 containers. And which are presently the vessels being built uh, in the shipyards in, in China and Korea are just waiting for recovery. They will also enter tra the transport market sooner or later. We look at road transport in France, for instance, here we see regard to this type of mode of transport, we see further development here. Uh, we already talked about rail transport, how important it is. Now we look at air transport with the new engines, the new planes, uh, the large planes, and the new opportunities here offered by Boeing and Airbus, which we will have in the future. Air traffic or air transport will develop tremendously, so we will have a huge demand for airports, for motorways, for rail connections, all of this needs to be built, and this will be vitally ex important. And since governments will not all win the lottery, so not everything can be funded with public money, so that means that uh, this partnership between public and private uh, enterprises needs to be developed. Maybe I was too optimistic, but still, I think uh, if we were optimistic in the past, uh, we should not turn pessimistic now, because right now we need the PPPs more than ever before. And especially in the transport sector, it will lead to a major shift in the developments. Uh, so here we, especially the main transport links uh, will, uh, they are to the will Before lead give, uh, to Lord construction McDonald's the management of infrastructure. Just to wrap up and, and the, what messages are coming out of this. Uh, Sunny Sana. Uh, I'll just to add that we talked about the public uh, sector, we talked about public partner, we talked about the financial partner. And for the private partner, I would like to add that the pre-qualification criteria in PPP tenders are very important. Market entry barriers has to be very high. Because in, in PPP projects, what we are doing, I mean, the private sector is taking care of the design, the construction, the completion guarantee, the operation, the efficient operation, quality of the operations, and uh, 
generating revenues and paying back the loans. So it has to be a successful example for countries and for, uh, for the PPP structure. Could I just press you on that question, though, about stable sources of private capital, pension funds, sovereign wealth? Do you have a view on that? Yes. Uh, now, in our company, we are a listed company, Tower Airports Holding, and we have uh, partners from pension funds and uh, infrastructure funds from uh, Canada. We have partners from uh, East, uh, Middle East and even North Africa. So we are experiencing their uh, intervening to the company and really the broadening the shareholder base helped us a lot. Enrique, final thought before I hand to Gus McDonald on this issue, particularly of funding of stable uh, long-term uh, measures, particularly from the finance side to at least maintain a stability in the whole PPP framework? Uh, well, I do believe that there's a big role to be played by both uh, sovereign funds, pension funds, and even infrastructure funds. Pension do you think sovereign funds would want to invest, given yes. what you outlined at yes, the beginning? Yes, they do, but I, I, I believe pension funds are way ahead. Uh, they've been in this business. They began investing in uh, through infrastructure funds, better if unlisted. Now they, they are investing directly. I don't think they, they will develop in the near term the ability to operate and perform and bid on their own a, a complex uh, highway concession, but they, they actually have a role already. I think it, they will take an, an increasing role because it's a perfect fit for their uh, liabilities. On the sovereign funds, I, I'm, I'm also uh, quite confident that uh, they will be important actors, but I think they are uh, behind in the process to the pension fund. So we started rather cautious and quite pessimistic, a degree of uh, upbeat reflection at the end. Gus, a final thought from you, please, as you came here with a report from one meeting. Can you offer us a, a summary from this one? Well, I, I think um, many of the remarks from a very uh, experienced and distinguished panel actually validate uh, some of the recommendations that came from our workshop yesterday. But I think that uh, what seems quite clear to me is that uh, risk is back, austerity may well be back, and the state is uh, back. And we will see uh, a much more uh, active role for the state, particularly in the transition period, and I hope it's transitional, that we are going through, because the uncertainties are very grave. And uh, I think we, we know that in the end, the money comes either from the, the taxes of citizens or from the, the citizens as consumers. So the state has to play uh, the pivotal role. It still will carry out uh, uh, most of the investment there. And when it comes to sharing risk, I think the state and public bodies will have to be more sensitive uh, to the needs of the private sector going forward. The, the private sector will still have to beat a higher hurdle rate in proving that it is more efficient as an agent of the state in running its essential community services. And I believe that, uh, that they, they can do that. I think that's proven in very many industries. But what we need are the, for the politicians to sell the benefits of involving the private sector, whether it's in PPP or privatization, because most of them, uh, as has been said, uh, tend to shy away from it. They don't want to confront the inherent unpopularity uh, that uh, still uh, survives. And no doubt the hostility to the profit motive will be more intense uh, after recent uh, international events. And just um, to be clear on the pension funds, there is a huge potential there. The OECD reckoned that in, in its countries there was about $18 trillion in pension funds. At the moment, the allocations are probably less than 1%. In the United Kingdom, with its very active pensions industry, it's 0.6%. But interestingly, in Australia, it can go from 5 to 10%. In Canada, it's the same. And of course, it's a very good story for politicians if you say, here's the people's money, uh, prepared to invest in the, the people's essential services. But, of course, these are, by definition, cautious uh, investors. So, again, the deals will have to be right before uh, we get the pension funds in. But, um, as I say, my, my major uh, uh, conclusion would be the one that I, I started with, is it needs now a much closer um, participation in a true partnership between the private sector and the states, with the state uh, taking the lead.
Lord MacDonald, thank you very much, and thank you to the panelists as well, and uh, particularly for the absolute precision of focus, even though we lost a bit of time at the beginning. So thank you very much indeed. We've ended on time where we hope to get to. Thank you.